There is no shortage of people claiming American Christianity is now power-hungry and working towards a theocratic, authoritarian government. They talk as if wanting or having power is somehow against the gospel or inconsistent with Christian faith. However, the truth is that having extraordinary power is essential to Christianity. The gospel of Jesus Christ promises power to those who accept him as Lord and follow him. In the Bible, the power to be saved from sin, the power to endure our sufferings with a peace that passes understanding, the power to be the light and salt of the earth, the power to walk in the love of God, and more is promised to all those who talk the talk and walk the walk. Although the gospel of Christ promises his followers the power to live well and endure the sufferings in this life with extraordinary grace, the whole New Testament denies that the followers of Christ shall have worldly power. In the New Testament, living well has nothing to do with having a retirement investment portfolio, a stockpile of guns, control of a government, good food, or an abundance of leisure. In the Gospel, living well has to do with being faithful to God's Word and the call of the Gospel to follow Christ, no matter what happens. Paul, a prolific New Testament writer, knew this well. He wrote, I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and and need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. The Christian who walks the walk is not afraid of the world nor allows the rulers of the world to be their highest counsel. Memes and popular slogans do not influence the functioning Christian more than the Bible. Worldly leaders have neither the knowledge nor the temperament of character necessary to advise Christians on the nature of necessary Christian power. Only God's Word describes the reality of Christian power. It ought to surprise no Christians that we must rely on God's Word rather than cartoonish memes on the Internet for understanding Christian power. The Christian does not rely on a TV talking head or a celebrity for their understanding of real power. A powerful Christian who walks the walk is not afraid to live and suffer for Christ's sake. As Romans says, We rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Paul did not seek worldly power, but spoke of the nature of Christian power, writing, For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. In Paul's day, Christians were imprisoned, tortured, and murdered. That was real persecution, and Paul was content to face and embrace horrible suffering for Christ's sake. Today, many American Christians will complain if they so much as get asked a sincere question about their faith that makes them uncomfortable. And then they proceed to cry out that they are being persecuted. The truth is that American Christianity has never experienced systematic persecution at all. We are not saying that Christians can't ever have any kind of worldly power or wealth. However, we are raising an important question. What happens when professing Christians completely ignore the teachings of Jesus and the guidance of the entire New Testament 
to focus exclusively on obtaining worldly power and wealth through worldly means. Throughout the history of Christianity, there have always been some Christians who fall away from the gospel. Instead of faithfully following the teachings of Jesus, embracing weakness and hardships with joy for Christ's sake, loving their neighbors as themselves, turning the other cheek, serving those in need, and loving their enemies, all remarkably clear and undisputable priorities of Christian living within the gospel of Christ. Those fallen Christians have demonstrated a tenacious capacity to choose the attainment of secular power and wealth through the path of deception, ruthless violence, and self-serving bigotry. Throughout this history of the Christian rejection of Jesus' teachings, every evil intention, every lie, every act of broken human nature, every betrayal of godly character are all done in Jesus' name. Deception, mass murder, slavery, thievery, torture, and every vile and violent thought and deed have been offered to humanity by power-hungry, worldly Christians as a ridiculous substitute for the teachings of Jesus. The gospel of Christ wants the human soul lifted up to God, reconciled and sanctified, but the worldly Christian merely lives for the imagined security and freedom of the flesh. The gospel teaches the importance of knowing truth, justice, and compassion in our living, but the Christian who knows only the love of their flesh is content with any deception, injustice, and brutality that serve their lust for worldly power. Such delusions of power are only fit for the wolves in sheep's clothing. These delusions of the flesh are not fit for the children of God. Those Christian worshipers of the world seemingly bent on seeing how far they can pervert the message of Jesus for their worldly gain, have very often paved the way to behavior that is explicitly and dramatically in violation of Jesus' teachings. There has been no butchery of rationality too demeaning, no act of human desecration too gross, no amount of seething hate or spiritual ineptitude too damning that cannot be eagerly justified by worldly Christians in the name of Jesus. In all of this is the spirit of all that is against Christ. When fighting for worldly power means more than following Jesus' teachings, the gospel's full power has died in the hearts and minds of those followers of Jesus who are seduced by the world. They may still be saved in spite of themselves, but they will spend the whole of their earthly lives rejecting much of the gospel of Christ merely to have an awesome investment portfolio, more power in the governance of their society, or an advantage for securing their reputation and position in worldly affairs. Those Christians who love worldly power more than the gospel spend the whole of their lives rejecting the word of God daily in order to worship the lords of the earth, as they give loyal service to their own flesh. The truth is that there is an extraordinary contrast between what the Bible says to do and what many lost and broken Christians say and do. The Bible says that if I speak in the tongues of men and angels but have not love, I am a noisy gong or clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. But when we know only our lust for power, our love becomes nothing. The frightened heart 
bound by animal instinct, is blind to Jesus while craving worldly power. When reeling in torment, our hearts do not know the gospel of Christ to the extent that we are still clinging to our fear, anger, and lust for strength. The fearful and faithless heart loves guns more than compassion and seeks wealth more than justice. But God is love and perfect love cast out fear. The Bible says that love suffers long and is kind. Love does not get jealous or brag, nor is it arrogant or rude. But when suffering and resentments fill the heart, we love to point our fingers at imaginary enemies and cry out about the perceived injustice. When we are caught up in the throes of overwhelming pain and confusion, we engage in every indulgence of jealousy, anger, and fear as we descend into being little more than groveling animals. When the character of a frightened, hungry animal becomes the character of our Christianity, we become vicious, spiritless, and lost. Eagerly grabbing at worldly power as we lose touch with the power of our faith in Jesus Christ is the path of the flesh. But Christians must pick up their cross and follow Jesus to love, serve, and die in his name as they are empowered by God's grace to put down their anger, fear, jealousy, resentments, and stop, stop fighting with other human beings like groveling animals. Godly Christian power that is alive and well within the human heart is kind, gentle, and serves the well-being of all humanity. The Bible says that love does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful, but a desperate lost heart has lost sight of Jesus and would rather risk seeing everything destroyed than not get its own way. When things such as ego, fear, or suffering cause us to lose sight of who we are supposed to be in Jesus Christ. The foundation of our existence is reduced to the concerns of the flesh. Fear, anger, and the lust for worldly power become the motivation for our whole being. Where is Jesus Christ in any of this? Where is God's love when our faithless irritations and fears lead us to rejoice over the ungodly power we feel when we are insulting our neighbor, lying to gain an advantage, or abusing humanity with intemperate violence. Spiritually alive Christians do not subordinate themselves to the flesh in a quest for worldly power. Christians who walk the walk of discipleship to Christ choose to be the love of God over being the lords of the world. They embrace being the victims of injustice rather than being unjustly violent towards others. The Bible says that love does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. But the spirit of all that is against Christ rejoices in every lie and every wrongdoing that can give us more worldly power. Deception and wrongdoing are not the godly path through which the disciples of Jesus Christ should seek to empower themselves. Deception and wrongdoing are no replacement for godly love or the wisdom that comes through living faithfully to Jesus' teachings. Christians do not accept lying, cheating, and unjust violence as a way to gain anything. The Bible says that love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. But when we are broken and lost, flailing without love, we are filled with fear, impatience, and a deep-seated lust to serve the well-being of the flesh. When we lose sight of Jesus Christ, we will act as if worldly powers are our only hope. 
When we forget our faith in Christ, we will live as if a faith in the benefit to our flesh is the only belief that enables us to endure any of the sufferings of life. The Bible says that God is love, and he that does not love does not know God. But if we do not put Jesus Christ first, our only response to fear and pain will be fighting for worldly control. The Bible says that if you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. In the absence of God's love, we will compete with one another like animals who always want to hurt those who think and live differently than we do. When we put our faith in Jesus Christ last, being good at hurting those others whom we ought to be serving, will consume our hearts. In the absence of God's love, the deception, misdeeds, and violence that bring us worldly power will shine as an inspiring proof of our imaginary righteousness. When we put our faith in Christ last, we forget that we are not of this world. The life of the worldly Christian is a life filled with the sickness of soul, the ignorance of mind, and the brokenness of character that manifests when we forsake the gospel of Jesus Christ in exchange for the thirty pieces of silver that the rulers of this world promise us. The Bible says that God is love, and who dwells in love also dwells in God, and God in him. But when we dwell in in our ignorance, anger, and violence. Then we dwell neither in love nor in God. When we put winning first, we put God's love last. When the rudeness, insults, and disrespect that come with animal competition replaces godly love, we will fill up our lives with the dregs of our own broken hearts and minds. Christ did not come so that what is least valuable within us will rule over that which is most valuable. The Bible says we should look at the fruits of those claiming to know God. Galatians 5.22 says that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. But the fruit of putting Christ last is hatred, woe, disharmony, impatience, rudeness, immorality, faithlessness to Jesus' teachings, lying, violence, and self-obsession. Such things are against the whole of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Matthew says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, you will recognize them by their fruits. When Christians lose the fullness of their faith in Jesus Christ, in order to secure their safety in the world, they are always seeking to justify the rotten fruits of those who can give them worldly power. The Bible is clear that the Christian life is not a life filled with vain justifications of our continued sinning. Matthew chapter 5 tells us that as Christians who honor Christ, 
we must suffer to realize the important blessing of godly character that lives within the poverty of our spirits. The crushed heart that relies on God alone will be restored in the kingdom of heaven. The followers of Christ are not to work to puff up their sense of self or to glory in the seizing of power in this world. In the obedience of Christian faith, Christians are supposed to realize the deeper blessing within their mourning and the righteousness of godly sorrow, not deluding themselves into thinking that our only blessing is to gain happiness because we have won the whole world by worldly means. The disciples of Christ walk in their faith, unafraid to embrace meekness, and their state of being blessed rises accordingly. Christians who actually follow Christ must not be obsessed with aggressively ruling the world through deception and violence as they stop following Jesus Christ in order to be ruled by their own flesh. Christians are to hunger and thirst for righteousness, not eagerly embrace worldly corruptions, dishonesty, and injustice. Those who dine on poisoned water shall remain unsatisfied. Christians have the character to allow their own blessing to flow out of their own mercy. Christians who faithfully follow Christ do not sow the seeds of ruthlessness and cruelty. For what we sow, so shall we reap. The power of Christ must be pure in heart, without guile or deception, for God does not dwell in darkness. Christians do not use deception and violence to steal the world, for such has no part of the gospel of Christ. The power and character of God is never seen during the animal conflicts of our flesh. The faithful Christian serves the king of peace, lives for peace, and will die for peace. Christians are not to be the harbingers of unjust war and intemperate violence, merely so they can enjoy ruling over a dark world by dark and violent means. The faithful Christian embraces persecution as a daily sign that they are giving light and love in a world filled with darkness and evil. Our blessing is in being children in the kingdom of heaven, not in being the lords of the world. The children of God are not the supplicants to deception and violence. The light and love that travels with God's salvation is the rightful fruit of the children of God. The Christian prefers to be slandered than to slander, to be lied about than to lie about others, to be the victim of injustice and not to be an unjust lord of this world. Christians gladly endure such sufferings for Christ's sake. The followers of Christ are to be the salt and the light of the earth, not a bastion of darkness and deception. We are to live without nurturing our anger, not spend our lives hurting others because they annoy us. When the New Testament talks about strength, it focuses on the strength of spirit and character that manifest godly love to all. The powers promised by the gospel are not the powers of the world. Neither Jesus nor Paul nor any book in the New Testament advocates that we focus our religious attentions on the strength of our investment portfolio, on our stock of weapons, or on our ability to mud-wrestle with our fellow citizens in the rudeness of animosity as we fight like animals over our social and political differences. Godly power is not the power to physically force our will on the world. Biblical strength is the strength to take a stand against our own flesh in service to Jesus Christ. In the strength that comes from the Spirit of God, we conquer our own animal self in order to step up and be more. The light and love of God do not force the eyes to become blind to evil, but empower us to see the truth. The Bible tells us that the Christian must be less concerned with armor of steel 
and more concerned with the armor of God. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. The power offered to us by Jesus is the power to walk in love through a desert of hatred, and yet be able to see and serve the good and the beautiful in the name of Jesus as we live in a wasteland of ugly ill will. To serve humanity as the light and salt of the earth is the path of real Christianity. To walk as the living love of God is the character of healthy, functioning Christians. The Christian is to live as a slave of God, not as the ruler of the world. The lying, cheating, violent partisans who claim all their slander and violence is done in the name of Jesus for the good of the nation are perfect examples of how easy it is to destroy the gospel of Jesus Christ. Living by deception and violence alone merely allows our sinful flesh to rule over all. Many politicized Christians regularly advocate the exact opposite of what the Bible says. Truth and peace are traded for deception and violence. The teachings of Jesus, which we are supposed to know intimately and live fully, are traded away by worldly Christians in exchange for memes composed by anonymous authors, slogans uttered by political parties, and the lies that use the gospel as an instrument to gain worldly power. This degradation is not Christianity. Doing the opposite of Jesus' teachings in the name of Jesus is not faithfulness to the gospel. This faithless rejection of the gospel of Jesus Christ and the whole New Testament is the bondage of Christianity to human fear and our anxiety for the flesh. But God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and of a sound mind. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the gospel. Do not be ashamed to exercise your capacity to reason about God's word with the sound mind that God gave you. Do not allow the gospel of Jesus Christ to merely be a handmaiden to your human politics or a slave to your animal fears. The Christian must put Jesus and his teachings first, or the Christian has to admit that their faith is at best a matter of extraordinary ignorance of God's word, or at worst, a fountain of evil lies. Real Christian power is the power to walk as a living expression of God's love, forgiveness, service, and sacrifice for all humanity. Real Christian power is needed greatly, but the Christians who operate out of fear, deception, and a love of worldly power put Jesus Christ back up on the cross and allow for an increasing spread of sickening evil to all humanity. Brothers and sisters in Christ, be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction, and to keep oneself unstained from the world. Christians who have a pure faith and religion do not grab at worldly power and wealth 
in the name of Jesus while victimizing the poor and the marginalized as they reject the teachings of Jesus. Those who do such evil in the name of Jesus Christ are either not Christians or are, at a minimum, unworthy of leading the body of Christ anywhere. The politically power-hungry Christians who want only violence to pave the way for their own power are not doers of the word. Those who use deceptions in all things to brag about themselves and to profit from deception are not doers of the word. The one who despises all those who are different from them is not a doer of the word. If you are Christian, be also a doer of God's word. Christ came not to rule the world, but to die on a cross for the sake of all humanity. Christians live according to the power of that mission and have an obligation of faith to pick up their own cross and carry it in a lifelong labor of love, service, and sacrifice for all humanity. Christians are not to fight to overcome the world as Jesus has already done this on the cross. The faithful Christian is, through the Lordship of Christ, to overcome themselves, that they may be spiritually fruitful as they pick up their cross and follow Jesus, to walk in the world as the living presence of God's love, to willfully do less, is to reject the teachings of Jesus and the entire New Testament. What happens when professing Christians completely ignore the teachings of Jesus and the guidance of the entire New Testament to focus exclusively on obtaining worldly power and wealth through worldly means. What happens is that the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ gets trampled underfoot in a rush to feed the security of the flesh. What happens is that the Christian faith comes to ruin in the hearts of those who have devoted themselves to winning power and wealth in the world. Do not be deceived by fake political Christianity, which constantly gives lip service to the name of Jesus, but despises his teachings. Brothers and sisters in Christ, be doers of the word, not hearers only. My